I was working for a congressman on the east end of Long Island, the first congressional district of New York. Um, and in September of 1992, my husband died. And George was reelected that um, November. And as he began to serve that term, I began to realize that Long Island was a very expensive place for a widow with a dependent child. Um, and I thought about moving down to this area and working for him mm -hmm. in D.C. And he, um, and he said, yes, he thought that was workable. So I began to investigate it. Now, I already knew um, Alexandria somewhat because um, I had come to Washington for other stories. My husband, who was a journalist, had two. I had a brother living in Springfield, and we had visited Alexandria a lot and really liked it. And we used to joke that when he retired, it would be a neat place to come and live because we could still freelance write or whatever. Um, but it was never very real. I mean, we, it was there as a possibility. And then, of course, after he died, things changed. But then I thought about when George said, sure, you can work for me in, um, um, Alex in uh, Washington, I started to look at Alexandria. I came and stayed with my brother. But then in 1994, he lost the election. That was the year of the big Republican turnover. And so I sort of debated, um, what was I going to do? And I... While I was, I was offered, the state of New York, it was at a recession in New York, was offering scholarships for one semester terms for people who wanted to catch up in their fields or related fields. So I got a scholarship and spent a semester studying computers, which I really didn't know, and taking management courses, and meanwhile looking for a job. And I had possibilities, and I sort of just took a deep breath, sold my house, and moved down here, and figured I had money to live on for a while. And I was only here a couple of weeks, and I was walking down King Street, and saw the Gazette packet in the little box, and pulled it out, and saw they were looking for a managing editor. So I just called up and said I was new in town, but I had a long experience and Krista Waters asked me to in for an interview. And I went home and she called me and I gave her references and all of that. And by Monday she had hired me. And she said, can you start right away? <laughs> so I started the very next day. And um, I discovered that it was a larger weekly chain than I had worked for before, um, but weekly community Papers, I think, are the same the world over, and why I always liked working for them, because you really report on the things that really matter to people. I mean, I know everybody gets wrapped up with what happens in D.C., but the reality is your kids go to school locally, the house you live in, the taxes are decided locally, the neighborhood, everything really depends on your local community. And I did a lot of driving around, talked to a lot of people to try to get to know Alexandria, and the more I saw it, the more I liked it. So I remember saying to Krista, I wanted to, you know, buy a place here, and I did. A year after I moved down, I um, bought this place, and and was I would never be able to afford it <laughs> today. I mean, there's been a boom. This was 90, uh, 1996 that I bought this place, but. Uh, I got to do really a little bit of everything. I covered the Gazette Packet and also the Mount Vernon Gazette initially. And um, if you're the local editor, you, you don't just write editorials and edit copy. You really go out into the community. You may even wind up covering things yourself if things happen and you can't get a reporter. Then, And I had was used to that. I had done that on Long Island, too. Um, you know, somebody has to do it, so... Um, and I've just always liked it um, because of the variety of things. You get to do a little bit of everything. You meet all kinds of interesting people. And in a city like Alexandria has fantastic people, you know, just an incredible diversity 
of people uh, from very well-known, very wealthy people to people you would think were very ordinary until you got to know them and found out the things they did and the things they changed just with their perseverance. So um, that's really how I got started here. Alexandria was changing from a um, actually a factory town, a, you know, a fishing town. Um, the Ford plant was here, a working class town, and a place where people of ordinary means lived, and poor people lived. Um, and that was beginning to change. I mean, obviously, Old Town was already in the process of being restored and renovated and made what it is today. Um, North Old Town was just kind of beginning when I first came here of, of the rehabilitation and, um, and changing. And the Del Rey, um, I remember distinctly, I found it charming and it reminded me of, you know, Connecticut where I grew up, but realtors steered me away feeling that a single woman, that it was really still not quite a safe neighborhood which when you look at it today is unbelievable that you could even think that because it's such a family-oriented, friendly um, place. Um, so uh, on the plus side, there were a lot of good changes, a lot of um, interesting businesses, local businesses that came in. Um, there was uh, on the not-so-plus side, as the city became more affluent, a lot of the poor were kind of pushed down Route 1. Um, and one of the things I know that some of the mayors worried about is they didn't want Alexandria to prosper at the expense of losing its diversity, which they felt was part of what made it such a unique place, that there were so many different kinds of people. I remember John Porter, at the, when he was principal at the high school, talking about I think at that point it was like 80-some flags hanging in the, um, in the hall representing all the different nationalities and groups that attended that school. And he, uh, he clearly felt that was a great asset and a great plus, and it was something the city was proud of. And um, I think that becomes now um, part, of, um, part of the future of Alexandria. How do you um, encourage small business, encourage um, big projects, but at the same time not still making room for all the people that lived here before, still making sure you have social services and you have a safety net, still making sure you have a good you know, school system. Um, so those are the ways. It definitely became a much more um, cosmopolitan, if that's the word you would want, city. And certainly, uh, people, it's an eating destination, it's an arts destination. Um, it's always been a historical destination. Um, and I'd say that's kind of how it's changed. As I said, my youngest son is autistic, and he had aged out of the system in New York on Long Island a, a, two years before. And his social worker had recommended either Fairfax County or Alexandria as having the most progressive programs, and um, South is not known for its um, services, and, but they felt they were exceptions. And uh, I lived in Fairfax County actually for a year before I moved, and I was just on a waiting list because it's such a huge place. So when I first got into the city of Alexandria, the first door to open was therapeutic recreation. Um, their, their system was pretty simple to join, and he had activities. It took longer because tests had to be made and so on, and, but I got, he got involved in the vocational training program. And I slowly began to see the system was very different from New York's, um, but that didn't mean it was better or worse. It was just different, and you had to learn the, the new ways of doing things. And it was while I was getting involved in this that, um, Two things happened. Um, my daughter, who is an artist, came to live with me for a short time, and she volunteered to teach um, art to the young, to the adults, to the rec department, and they were greatly they were thrilled. So they set up this Monday afternoon program that she ran, 
And I began to hear from her all the things she thought these kids should have and, and all the creative ideas she had. And she was a very good scrounger at getting it because art materials are expensive, but she's really good at figuring out ways of getting overcoming that. But between that and between um, conversations I had with parents, that's when I decided, and, and that was to get involved with the Community Service Board. I hadn't before that because there had always been this strict split. If you were an editor, you really, you definitely didn't get involved in politics, and you really were supposed to be very careful of what other kind of volunteer work you did. So I had been involved in groups on Long Island, um, so uh, from the time Sean was an infant. But um, it wasn't until 2003 that I joined the Community Services Board as a member. And then the last four years, I was chair. And um, it, was a very, it was a very educational experience um, because they have yearly conventions in um, either in Virginia Beach or Roanoke or, or Richmond at which um, they offer all these educational workshops and things and tell you the latest theories, the latest programs and so on. And that, that was very helpful. And then um, the staff in Alexandria was very good about educating the board on all the things we should know and upcoming problems. And I became a lobbyist. I had lobbied for funding before as an editor, you know, on various things when we reviewed, but I had never done it um, as an advocate, in which we, the Community Services Board would do. We would present our wish list to the city and to the state. Okay, the Community Service Board is a group of 16 volunteers that provide oversight f and for different jurisdictions. There are 40 of them in Virginia. Um, for mental health services, alcohol and drug addiction services, and um, developmental disability services. Um, they review the budget and um, basically are the, the um, civilian overseers, so to speak. Nina came to us by us, I mean the Gazette Packet, and to speak to Jerry Vernon and Peter Labowitz and myself, was editor at the time, um, because because of her long history as a photographer and a local photographer, every time someone who was prominent died, she would be getting a phone call, do you have a current or a relatively current photo of this person? And she began to realize there were people they were missing. And from that sort of thing, and these were people who had done fantastic things for the city or were interesting historical figures. and. She came up with this idea of a, a photography project that would basically be a record of contemporary history by finding people who made a difference, who created something that would not have existed otherwise or in some way changed the community and made things better. And she wanted this to be a, a a historic record with a story and a photograph, and so that never again would would there be a case where someone there would be very little record on someone. So um, she came to, um, as I said, to the paper, and they were very enthused about the idea, and they were the first sponsors. And Jerry and I both agreed to serve on the original board. Um, that's almost too formal a word for what it was, but there was a small group of us who got together to sort of hammer out how, they, how we were going to select these people, what were the criteria going to be, uh, what were we going to do with um, the materials that we gathered. And it sort of it evolved from there. Um, it wasn't just an award ceremony. Uh, Nina was very adamant about the historic and the record, so we uh, had a catalog from the first year. That catalog went to the Richmond State Library, to our library, and to um, <clears throat> the Library of Congress. 
And then we were able, after several years, to have, strike a deal with historic um, group so that it, too, it, they archive uh, the um, portraits, which is fantastic because to do it correctly, you probably know, to do it correctly, it, um, it requires skill and knowledge and the proper temperatures and all the rest of that. Um, and it just grew from um, that small beginning and that idea of preserving knowledge of the lives of the people who would someday be in the history books maybe, but whom we were going to try to get while they were still around to tell us why they did what they did and, and what they felt they accomplished and all the rest of that. And that's basically how it started. Um, we became much more formal as things went on. We established a fairly large board. I'm not sure what it is now. Initially, we had a committee that was part board members and part not that chose the legends. And then someone said, well, if that's our main purpose for being, we all should be involved in the choosing process, the whole board. That should be the biggest thing we do all year. So um, that got changed. But um, I think now after 10 years, um, it has really established itself, and we've certainly already established quite a bit of um, historical material, not to mention the wonderful portraits and um, the videos and so on, all of which people a hundred years from now can look at and really know who the people were in the city at this time and place. The person who had the biggest impact on my life in terms of thinking about people with disabilities um, was actually a priest I knew from my childhood who um, in the 30s, in those days, they sent their best and brightest to Europe to study. So he spent his the 30s in Germany while Nazis were rising and had to be rescued out of there at, at the end of the 30s and came home and was ordained and then promptly joined as a chaplain and served in the, the African campaign. Um, but he came back from those two experiences with this passion of like never again. He not only used to come in and talk to us little kids about the Holocaust and about all the horror things that happened, but he also talked about the way people with disabilities were treated, people with who were feeble-minded, um, and how they were not granted the dignity they deserved, the dignity and respect. And he even spent time designing a catechism for people with disabilities so that they could be part of the church community. And he would, and it really stuck in my head um, because he was so passionate about this and about never having this kind of horror happen again where people would be rejected or because of their faith or their disabilities that um, I wound up, you know, like when I was in, in uh, college, I tutored kids who were having trouble in school. Um, I was friends with a, a girl who had a little brother with Downs and we used to visit him at his, he was in an institution. And it just, I just always remembered him and it just sort of stayed with me. And I covered, uh, as a young reporter, women weren't allowed um, to do the, the sexy stuff, you know. We, we, so I pushed to cover, like, education stories. Like in Albany, they were having, I was living there then, they were having a great many discussions on special ed and, and who should be included. Um, and I covered all of that stuff. And I covered... Um, um, all these various, uh, they were just beginning, people with physical disabilities were just beginning to get organized and say, hey, we have a right to be in the theater and to get on the bus and, you know, so on. And I covered all these stories because the guys didn't want to, frankly. And I just found it my, um, and then it sort of evolved. I got interested in medical stuff. And, um, and then when it hit home with my own child, um, I went from making it a, a big part of my profession to um, getting involved with um, 
I started a special education PTA in my elementary school because I felt the regular PTA was not concerned. I started a special education religious classes uh, in my parish, where, which I got a lot of support for. Um, and I just sort of always continued this. And the longer I did it, the more different kinds of people I got to meet. Um, I had, for example, one change, I'd say, in my life was that while I had a great deal of empathy for people with mental illness or with developmental disabilities, people with addiction, particularly young people, used to upset me because I felt they did it to themselves and how could they take their beautiful brains and bodies and do those things to them. And then as I got to know them, I realized that no, it wasn't that simple, that, that their lives were just as tormented and, and difficult as my sons or, or, my, or friends I had who had mental illness. Um, and it was a lot, just a lifetime of education on what a strange, um, you know, how different the human mind is and how different individuals are. And even people with grave disabilities also have gifts. And, you, you know, you, you start to see that when you've done it long enough. So that's kind of, and I really owe it all to, I guess, to Father Butcher's passion when he came home from the war and... He really wanted to raise a whole generation of kids that would come out of, he used to say, come out of the fortress, the Catholic fortress, and get involved in the community and get to accept everybody. The best way to be of service is find something you are passionate about that you love, whether it's, um, I had, a, I had a cousin, for example, who was passionate about creating parks and play spaces for children, and she devoted all her volunteer time to that. Whatever it is, um, it, I think in order to do it well, you have to really, really care about whether it's art, you know, it's, it's bringing music to the community, whatever it is. Um, and then once you do that, I think you need to learn about it, um, talk to people who you want to help, um, do a lot of reading and research. Um, I used to even go to um, <coughs> lectures and classes just to, to get some handle on what works and what doesn't and um, why some people are, people resist being helped and how you, you know, are there ways you can approach somebody like that without being threatening or overwhelming or patronizing. But I really think it first has to start with passion. You really, really, and I believe everybody has to have passion for something. They just have to find it. And I think I've been lucky because my passion sort of intertwined in my work and in my volunteer work. Over all the years, um, I've been a journalist and um, and there are people who have accused me of being cynical, and I, I am cynical about some, some things. But one of the things that has amazed me and still does is how many incredible people there are out there. You know, I, I know a lot of uh, people who sort of feel that politicians aren't worth much, say. And yet I met over the years a lot of people in public office whose work was incredible, whose energy and um, was tireless and who just, you know, they really led good lives, but people didn't realize it because I guess they just took it for granted. And I, the same with um, all kinds of people from teachers I've met and principals and doctors and that you find out um, when you get the experience of actually interviewing them in depth and following them around and about what special lives they lead and yet people don't even realize they've got this person in their midst who's not just really really good at what they do but they do it willingly and openly and and give a lot you know and I think that was one of the best things about the job was over all these years meeting all these people who um were so interesting and even uh some of the scoundrels <laughs> were were interesting too in in different ways and I mean there were times when some of them frightened me there were times when uh, you know I found them appalling 
but it was just this whole kaleidoscope of people you get to see and talk to and uh, that you would never ever in your ordinary life do.